Right, so Davis says, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Davis. So Sarah is joining from Don Simon. Okay, so you can tell us also something um, about astronomy you like. So um, let's see people active in the chat. So whilst we are getting people to uh, put down um, where they're joining us from. I should just remind everybody that um, you're welcome again to our monthly free astronomy online section. Um, so in this edition, we are going to talk about asteroids um, just um, because this month happens to also be um, the international um, kind of month of um, asteroids, uh, which is where we um, talk about asteroids. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering why we actually have a day for asteroids. Um, so, Hopefully in this section, you are going to find out why we have an asteroid day. Um, even if you don't know what asteroids are, you can also find out that um, shortly. So um, it's great to have um, you guys all here and um, I'm looking forward to a great section. So um, yeah, we also have um, Dr. Um, Sarah Barton who is with um, the um, KMUST. Um, and um, he's actually a lecturer and also a researcher there. And he's going to actually serve as a special guest for today's section. So um, you're welcome, um, Dr. Ciro um, Martin. So we also have in the chat, um, Davis says that my name is Davis and I'm joining from Ghana. Yeah, Davis, um, you're welcome also. So um, yeah, hope, uh, hope you actually have fun today. I think we will wait uh, for more people to join. I just want to remind everybody that um, this is open to, um, I mean, both young people and adults. So um, whenever you put anything in the chat, be uh, polite um, so that um, we can all enjoy the section. And I should also ask um, people to use the um, raise hand option. If you have any question, just use that and you can be invited to ask a question, a question or make a contribution if you do have any. And I think we are going to have, of course, um, a question and answer section where you can ask um, other questions that you may have. Um, so from the chat, we have Isaac Kudu who says, hi everyone, uh, I'm Danny from Gabon, um, which is uh, in South Africa. So Isaac, you're welcome and thank you so much for joining our section. Right, and also, um, if you just joined, um, you can also mute your sound so that uh, we do not have um, feedback. Yeah, if I, hi everybody, it's Sarah here. But if I can just repeat what Solomon said, please, when you join the session, if you can please uh, go on mute, please mute your microphone so that we don't get background noise. Sometimes it's very distracting and difficult to hear what the speaker is saying. So I'd really appreciate it if you can mute. First coming, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. 
So um, I think it's just seven minutes after five. So we will just wait three more minutes and then we can start. So you're welcome. And if you just joined, you can put your name and um, where you're joining us from um, so that we can kind of get to know everybody um, just share it in the chat. Right, so in the chat, we also have um, Samuel says, um, I'm Samuel and I'm from Cape Coast. So thank you, Samuel, for joining and um, you're welcome. We're hoping that everybody will have fun today. Right, so this one more minute and we can start. All right, so um, it's 10 minutes past five, so I think we can um, start. Oh, I said five, sorry. So um, yeah, it's actually 10 minutes past five here in the UK, but um, I think in Ghana it's 10 minutes past four. So welcome everybody for um, joining our Everything Astronomy um, section. So if this is the first time you are joining, um, I will, we would like to welcome you um, once again to um, this section. So um, this is a section where we talk about different, different and themes or topics in astronomy. So um, I think in the past we have had sections where we talk about specific telescope, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, we have had sections where we invite special guests to talk about some of the research they are working on. So we have had people talk about um, exoplanets, um, among others. So if you love astronomy, this is where you have you want to be at the last or during the last Saturday of every month, where you can get to and talk about some of these very, very amazing um, things in, um, in, in astronomy. So just uh, go straight to the point. Um, so today we have um, Dr. Cyril um, Boatin, um, who is a researcher and also a lecturer at KNUST. I'm sure he will mention or you talk a little bit more about himself and then what he does in today's section. So he's our special guest and um, I bet that you are going to enjoy today's section. So you need to uh, make sure that you um, you stay with us and throughout the entire section. So um, um, without that, I should just quickly go on. So um, this month actually happened to be um, Asteroid um, Day, um, and the exact date is on the 30th of June. Every um, every year, we actually have um, we celebrate Asteroid Day, and hopefully, you'll be able to find out why we actually celebrate um, the day as Asteroid Day. So again, um, to um, host the section or to be with you for the section. Um, so I'm Solomon and um, I'm a science and astronomy communicator. Um, and um, I hope you would, um, yeah, I mean, we can get to um, talk about some of the other stuff that we will do um, together. And also we have Sarah, who is also um, 
an event um, coordinator at the Ghana Planetarium and also with the African Astronomical Society. So Sarah, if you can say hi. I was muted. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so um, I'll just go straight. I think that's all. All right. So um, we both um, do kind of work for the Ghana Planetarium Science Center, uh, which is a center where we pro actually promote the study of space science and astronomy in Ghana. And um, I think you can get to visit the planetarium to have a feel of um, the planetarium, which is a place where you have a special projector, which um, shows you a simulation kind of um, of space and some other interesting um, themes. So definitely visit the Ghana Planetarium if you happen to be in Ghana. And then also um, to help the section. So actually this is organized by the Ghana Planetarium and also um, Xavier Space Solution, which is um, a space startup in Ghana, which is um, also looking forward to actually promoting space science. And we are organizing or we have been organizing um, events or projects such as um, the Ghana Cancer Rocketry Championship, which is just a, ch a championship where we teach students how to build miniature satellites. Um, so I think that should be it for me. Over to Sarah. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So just briefly, um, I'm going to just talk briefly about what are asteroids and why it's important that we study them, just so that everybody, I know we have all different people joining the session, so some may know more about asteroids already and some may not. But uh, just a slight sort of digression um, before I do that. Hold on, if I can get to the slide. Okay. Um, Sorry, I think all these things are in the way. Let me move these things. Okay. Uh, there, uh, interestingly enough, there are ways that uh, you, as an ordinary person, you don't have to be a, a scientist or an astronomer, can discover an asteroid for yourself. So there's this project called the International Astronomical Search Collaboration. It's what they call a citizen science program, meaning it's a program that you know anybody can take part in. And you just go to this website and you can register. And what happens is that if when they accept you onto a search, because uh, they do a search every month, you get sent images and uh, some software and you have to learn how to use the software. But it's fairly straightforward to look at images and the, the software allows you to look at images over time. So you'll see if there's something moving across the images and that something could be an asteroid. Uh, sometimes it's not, sometimes it is. So uh, last year, uh, the Ghana Planetarium, we put together a team, so you can see both Solomon and I were on there, and some other people also joined us. And uh, I think it was in August, and we analysed, I think, about 20 sets of images. And the exciting news is we made a provisional discovery of an asteroid. So, uh, well, this is very exciting because first of all, they come back and they say, oh, you've made like a preliminary detection. And then they, then they sort of have to do some verification. And they came back and said, yes, this is an original discovery and it's reported to the Minor Planet Center and the International Astronomical Union. There's a whole load of process they have to go through and to verify the orbit and all sorts of characteristics. But eventually uh, we'll be able to name it, but I think it might take about five years or 10 years. But, uh, but yes, so myself and Rosa, we uh, made a provisional discovery of an asteroid. So that was very exciting. So if anyone else is interested, you can uh, go off to the asteroid search uh, program and, and join in as well. So back to today, <laughs> asteroids. What are asteroids and why should we study them? Um, I'm just going to get, I, I, I've, I've done this before, but I quite like to get the jargon out of the way. Um, so something that's not an asteroid, but people sometimes get confused, is a comet. So a comet is basically a, an, a, a body, it's a chunk of ice and rock coming from the outer solar system, meaning, you know, out from beyond Neptune. Um, and because it's very icy, when it gets close to the sun, the ices uh, evaporate into gas and that's what gives it this great tail. So um, if it's bright enough to see with the naked eye, this is what they look like, very beautiful. But an asteroid is basically just a rock um, orbiting the sun 
uh, I mean, usually, or many of them are between Mars and Jupiter. That's where the main asteroid belt is. And they're all different sizes and shapes, but typically maybe from about one meter to you know, one kilometer across. And there's, the, and there's probably millions of those, but there are also millions of much smaller items that are just like fragments of rock. Some of them almost just like a grain of dust and they're called meteoroids. So the very small kind of fragments are called meteoroids. And then the, the more kind of, you know, substantial rocks are called asteroids. Now, although most of these things are in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, um, often they can be knocked off course, there can be collisions or they can get sort of pulled by other planets and so on. So they come into the inner solar system and some of them are already in the inner solar system. And so sometimes they um, get into the Earth's atmosphere. And so when you see this bright streak of light that, light that we normally call a shooting star, that's called a meteor. So that's when one of these asteroids or meteorite meteoroids actually uh, goes into the Earth's atmosphere and it burns up in the atmosphere. So that's a, what we call a what we call a shooting star, but the real name is a meteor. Often the whole thing burns up in the atmosphere, but if it doesn't, if some fragment of it reaches the Earth, then the bit that reaches the Earth is called a meteorite. So I don't know if you can see all those people, they're pointing at a little black rock on the ground. Um, so often these meteorites, as you can imagine, are quite small, but sometimes they are very large. So we've got something there called the Hober meteorite, which is found in Namibia, which is the largest meteorite that we still have on the Earth's surface. And so basically asteroids, are, they're small objects left over from the formation of the solar system. So they can tell us actually a lot about the solar system. They come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, they can be rocky or metallic or a kind of mixture. And some of them can be very dense and solid, or some can be more kind of loose, like a kind of pile of rubble. And as I've already said, they can go from just a dust, like a grain of dust to hundreds of uh, uh, meters across. And often they're these strange irregular shapes as you can see here. Um, so this is just showing the position of the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. But these dots all represent where asteroids can be found, not, not um, the size isn't to scale, of course. But so you can see that there are other dots you know, in the inner solar system and then further out and in the orbit of Jupiter. So they're not only in the asteroid belt. And then why, why should we study them? Well, there, there's, there's many different reasons. Um, firstly, just for general scientific reasons, um, asteroids can tell us about the formation of the solar system since they were kind of left over from that time. Um, also for resources. Sorry, let me move that. So research has shown that asteroids can contain all sorts of different elements um, and some of these elements, uh, you know, we, we might be able to mine them to bring them back to Earth, or it could be that they could be useful in space exploration. You know, if you're going from Earth out to a distant planet, maybe halfway there, you can stop at the asteroid belt and mine an asteroid for some uh, minerals that you need to take you further. So it, this is still kind of uh, a bit in the future, but there are companies already looking at doing this. And then, of course, uh, we want to know about asteroids because of planetary defense. So asteroids do hit the Earth. Um, normally, the ones that, you know, the vast majority of those tiny little grains of dust that, that burn up in the atmosphere, but occasionally larger ones do hit. And the more we know about the asteroids, about their orbit, about what they're made of, um, then we can come up with some kind of uh, strategy for what's the best way to defend ourselves. Is it to uh, just push it a bit out of orbit? It, you know, people often think, oh, we blow the whole thing up, but that actually might, you know, make things worse. But it depends. So there's, there's different strategies that are being thought about. But, you know, to come up with a strategy, you need to know more about the asteroids in the first place. Uh, so when an asteroid hits, uh, we get these craters, and uh, you know, I'm sure most, well, some of you may have seen through the telescope or the binoculars, the moon, all these, so many craters that you can see, also on Mercury and on Mars. And there are also some craters visible on Earth, and if you wanted to find out exactly how many there are and where they all are, there are some online resources, this Earth Impact Database and uh, the Impact Earth website. 
And when you go onto the map, you'll see some of the, the, the craters that they, they know um, exist, obviously on land, there may be others in other places. And you can see that there's one in Ghana. And that is where Lake Basomtri is in the Ashanti region. And uh, I've actually been there. It's very beautiful. Sorry, my mouse. Is, okay. So there I am at Lake Basomtri. That's what it looks like if you're actually there. Uh, and so later on, uh, that's we'll be talking to our guest speaker, Dr. Boateng, about uh, Lake Basomtri and its origins. But now I believe we're going over to Solomon. Oh. oh, yes. So that was amazing. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Um, so I just like to say quickly that if you just join, please make sure you mute your sound so that you don't um, get any feedback. Um, so Sarah has given an introduction to asteroids and um, probably what they are and everything else and a few of the things that you may um, have been confused about in terms of differentiating between what a comet is and then and the others. So hopefully those are clear. So um, I'll just quickly go on to uh, my part. So what uh, before I actually go on, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about um, some of the um, different missions that you have actually had to asteroids. So you know that, I mean, people have been to the moon and those other stuff, but is it easy or is it difficult to actually be able to visit an asteroid uh, because they are just um, rocks uh, and then those stuff. But before I actually go on to do that, I just want to ask if anybody knows why um, on the 30th of June, we actually called, um, or oh, this is the day that we celebrate asteroids. Do we have um, anybody who knows that? Okay, so if you do know, you can put it in the chat, uh, but because of our time, I'll just go straight forward and, and talk about it. So about um, 100 years ago, um, we had um, an, actual, an actual impact from an asteroid um, in a place called Tuganska um, in Siberia, uh, modern Russia. Um, and it was on the 30th of June. And um, I'm going to show you a few images so you can see what it actually looked like when we had the asteroid um, strike. And because of this, um, then scientists um, and, and a whole lot of other people said, okay, then this is a big deal. This can actually destroy the Earth if we have um, a huge one. So why don't we um, have a day where we talk about asteroids and why they are important? So um, that's why on the 30th of June every year, we actually celebrate International Asteroid Day. So let's go to some of the missions. So we have actually had a few missions already and uh, a few more coming up, which are visiting a few of these asteroids. So we do have the double asteroid redirect, uh, redirect uh, test, uh, which is called that. Um, and this is a planetary defense mission, which means that um, Sarah have already mentioned that some of these asteroids uh, may harm the Earth, which means that we, sh we should be able to understand how we can defend the Earth. So um, this, um, that mission is one that is um, able to um, study these asteroids and offer a way by which we can actually be able to defend the Earth. And I think the mission um, would be to demonstrate if it would be possible for um, the a spacecraft like um, that to be able to deflect an asteroid if it's heading towards Earth so that we don't have um, any I mean, harm from it. So this was launched um, last um, year. And another mission that we also have coming up um, is um, the one that is called Lucy. Um, now the main mission for Lucy is to um, be able to actually um, study um, a few of the asteroids that we have around Jupiter, which is called the Trojan um, asteroids. Um, and um, this is a very exciting one. And it's actually named after um, the fossilized human ancestor, which you may know called Lucy. Um, and the reason why we believe this is important is because it's going to study these Trojan asteroids, which are the leftovers of the formation of the solar system, which means kind of going back into time to understand how our planet um, was formed which is why um, Lucy mission is um, amazing. I think when it launched, we actually did a section on this, which is amazing. And um, so followed by Lucy, we have Psyche, uh, which is going to just study metal rich asteroids. Um, and the launch was supposed to be this year, but it's been delayed. So um, hopefully we'll be able to have it launch um, soon. 
And then we also have the OCREX um, Rex or OCREX Rex, uh, which is for um, the spectral um, interpretation, resource identification, security, regulate explorer. Uh, now this is very special because it actually went, but it went to an um, to an asteroid and then picked samples from it. I think last two years or so, and it's now heading back to the Earth. So the name of the asteroid that I went to was called asteroid Bennu, and this is amazing because once we have um, some of those samples from an actual asteroid, it would um, help us understand a little bit more about asteroid. Then um, one of my um, favorite one is um, the one called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. Um, and this is a very crazy mission if you want to think about it, uh, because what this mission is, is um, we actually send a spacecraft, which is actually um, going to go to where we have a few of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, pick one of them, and bring it into the moon's orbit, and then um, ast um, astronauts from Earth can actually go to the moon, study them, and then take samples um, back to the moon base and also to the Earth. So it's a very crazy one. And I think it was approved to, um, it was approved in 2017, but I think NASA has this on hold. So if you want to check more, you can just go to the NASA website and you see, but there's still no date on when this mission would be. Um, so thank you so much. I think I've actually said a whole lot more, but um, I hope um, now you have an idea of some of the missions we have to ask the way. So that should be it for me. And Sarah, I think we have, um, uh, do we have Dr. Sira coming up? Yeah, so now we, we, we'd we like to go over to our, our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Cyril Boateng from KNUST. And as we said earlier, um, uh, we have this impact crater uh, in Ghana, Lake Basom Tree. And very interestingly, uh, Dr. Cyril has been doing some, uh, some research there. And I have to say, when I first heard about Lake Basom Tree and that it might have a, 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 an asteroid impact history, I mean, honestly, I've been searching for years for somebody <laughs> to tell me more about it. And then I can't even remember exactly how we connected, Sarah, but when, you know, we finally collected and you said, oh, yes, yes, I've done some research. I was like, yes, you know, so I was so excited. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I'd like to hand over to Cyril for, for the next part of the session. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, um, Solomon. Uh, it's always a pleasure um, joining you guys on, um, at the Ghana Planetarium. And then um, talking about science, geophysics, impact creators and stuff like that. It, it, it's always great. Um, we want to spread the word. We want more people in science, you know. So the more people hear about it, the better it is. So it's great to be here. And welcome, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen and then we can go right Hey, can you all see my screen, please? Is that okay? Great. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to talk about how we investigated the meteorite impact origins of Bosun Chi. So um, uh, Sarah has talked about the, what a meteorite is. <clears throat> when an asteroid gets to Earth, then we, we, we call it a meteorite. And it, when it gets to Earth and it doesn't burn up in the atmosphere, then you are sure it's going to cause, uh, if there's still a huge uh, mass left over, then it's really going to cause a huge um, like crater on Earth because this is moving at high speed. Um, it's burning up in the atmosphere. It crashes into the Earth high speed. So it, it causes a huge crater on, on, on Earth. So there's one such crater in, in Ghana um, I don't know whether to say lucky us or unfortunate. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> at least we have one in Ghana and, and it has been the subject of a lot of research. Um, so I'm going to talk about that, the research that has been done and, and um, maybe what we still think of doing in the future. So um, I'm Dr. Cyril Watson, as they've said, I'm, I'm with the Department of Physics. If you are interested, you can contact us um, at the Department of Physics and we will do more work. So let's say um, about 1.07 million years ago, um, let's say, I'm not sure we had as human species like um, those of us here now around at that time, but we could have probably had a different species. Um, we had different kinds of animals there. And then all somewhere in the middle of Ghana, um, minding their own business, not really knowing what is going on. 
<laughs> and then unknown to them, way up outside the atmosphere of the Earth, there is an asteroid that is fast approaching. Um, our estimation is about 700 meters wide. It's moving at 20 kilometers per second. And then it, it enters the, the atmosphere at this oblique angle, all right? Now, if we were to look up at the sky, it would, it would just be like what Sarah said. You see this um, flash kind of um, something burning up approaching, but right? you probably think, oh, really, maybe it's just um, 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 a shooting star, <laughs> like you say, so just passing by. Um, unfortunately for them, this, this is not that. It's rushing right to where they are. So it crashes down in the middle of Ghana, what we call present day Ghana. And then we have this, the impact is like several nuclear bombs put together. So imagine what one nuclear bomb can cause. And then it's like several nuclear bombs put together. It's, we have this uh, bright light explosion, large fragments of ash and debris will probably fly out of this, uh, um, this um, impact with the crater all around. And the radius will be almost the whole of middle Ghana. Okay. So we we'll have a huge fireball in the and burning up everything in the vicinity. Um, the shock waves just from the impact will flatten trees, kill animals, and will be heard all around the world. That's that's what will actually happen. It will, it will probably trigger an earthquake, the ground will shake and the impact will be felt for several kilometers. And then the ejected impact fragments. So what you mean by that is that the, the fragments flying out of the crater will start falling back down. And then by this time, there's maybe some level of silence. Everything is gone. Everything is destroyed. And everything starts falling back down, right? So that's how the impact would have happened. So you think everything is back to normal. Really, what has happened? 1.07 million years later, um, this place is like the most beautiful place on earth. There's no record of what actually, it doesn't look like there's a record of what actually happened. And, and yes, Sarah was right. It's one of the most beautiful places for, for me on earth. And uh, if you ever have the chance, if you've ever been to Busum Tree, get there. It's, the crater is now covered with a lake. There's um, about 20 communities all around the lake, depending on the lake, the fish there. Uh, there are farms, cocoa farms, cassava farms, plantain farms. Really nice, it's, it's a serene place. And of course, now we have a lot of tourists going there. Um, and so there are resorts um, there as well. Okay. So if you're looking at it from space, um, this is what you see. So the crater that is left is about 10.5 kilometers in diameter. And like I said, it's filled with a lake. The lake is, it just doesn't fill the whole crater. So it's about eight kilometers in diameter. And, and the maximum depth that has been measured is about 75 meters, which is uh, pretty deep. It's pretty deep, yes. Now I've said all this, uh, the, 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 what you wonder is, well, how do we know it's a meteorite impact crater? Um, are we just guessing a scientist or somebody just woke up and said, oh yeah, I think it's a meteorite impact. And that's where the cool science comes in because then we have to do a lot of science to actually determine that it's a meteorite impact crater. Okay, so, um, so recently we're doing, um, um, we're, we're, we're going to some of the old work that has been done at, um, at Bosom Tree. And we, we discovered that even as far back as 1899, the people, they had actually complained to the um, British government that um, there was this, they had like in a two year cycle, there was um, bubbles that came out from the bottom of the lake and it was accompanied by this um, smell of sulfur, right? So the communities that are actually complaining, and that's what actually got um, scientists from the geological survey um, of the British um, you know, colon uh, colonial um, powers at that time interested because by that time they, they hadn't gotten there, they didn't know there was, there was an impact crater. So that was actually what got them interested. So the first scientists, the geologists who went there were thinking, okay, so what formed this? Is it a volcano or is it an impact crater? Because actually um, the crater that is left 
whether it's a volcanic eruption or um, a, a meteorite impact, they, they always look similar. So it's actually tricky determining which is which. And that's why I say then you need a lot of science to see the difference, to know the difference, because you, you are not there when it happens. So how do you know what exactly happened, right? So that's the thing. So that's where um, my field comes in, geophysics. So geophysics, um, it, it's a field that uses um, um, the, the physical forces that we study all the time. And then um, if you've done any science, you heard about magnetism, you've heard about waves, you've heard about gravity. Um, we use uh, electrical resistivity, we use all these um, forces, and then we use that to understand how um, the subsurface looks like. So it's kind of like if you were a superhero and you had um, special powers to look under the earth and see what is there. That's, that's what geophysics is. So it's really cool, right? Uh, so, um, so for an impact crater, to determine whether it's an impact crater or a volcanic crater, you need to be able to see below the, the earth, to see what is actually under the earth, what is the structure there? Because um, that is what we tell you what the cause, the origin is. Um, so let me give you an example. So if, if you had a, a, a volcanic eruption, um, the eruption will come out from the hole, everything blows out, um, there'll be a huge hole in the middle, uh, but you, you, you will not have any filling in the middle, kind of, it will take a long time. For a meteorite impact crater, what happens is there's something always in the middle we call an uplift, a slight uplift in the middle, and you have to identify that. But this is under the ground or under the lake. So how do you identify that? And that's how come I said um, geophysics comes in. So let's let's look at some of those methods. Um, the one up on the screen now is what we call the, the seismic. It's a seismic image. Um, a seismic image is, um, let me explain, using if you go into a room or, um, and you shout, you hear an echo because your, 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 the sound you make bounces off the walls and gets back to your ear. Right. The same thing, that's what a bat uses to find its way around. So a bat doesn't see, but um, it can um, emit sounds. The sounds bounce off all the things, insects, walls and stuff. And then the bat can use that to detect whether to avoid a wall or to fly over a tree or that kind of thing. So um, in seismic, we use something similar. We can generate artificial waves. Um, either by just um, using a huge equipment, vibrate, um, put it on the ground, as it vibrates, it generates waves into the air, right? Or we could use dynamite. Uh, it explodes, it sends waves into the air. Now this shakes the layers of the air, okay, the subsurface. But as it goes down, the wave goes down, it gets to maybe another layer, which is different from the one above it. And then it bounces back, right? And as it bounces back, we put sensors on the whole surface of the air and we pick up this, um, pick up this um, uh, vibration, the energy. And then the moment you pick it up, you can tell, okay, so how deep is the layer that it bounced from, the, the energy bounce from, you can see how deep it is. So using that, we can get an image like what is up on the screen right now, and then interpret, let's see the different layers. So if you, if you look at that image right now, you can see that there seems to, you can see layers in there, you can see a, a little structure in the middle right there, right? So. So that's how seismic um, uh, works. So using this image, um, a geophysicist will then try and see, okay, there are different layers in the ground, like the image that is up there now. And each of the images, uh, each of the layers we have, right? Um, the speed of the energy going through them is at, it's at different speeds for each of the layers. So that tells us the layers are different and they are made of different things. Okay? So we can then have interpret a structure of the subsurface um, and then know, okay, there's something there. So we'll end up with something like this, what is up there now as an image of what is there. So for the Bosom tree, this is like an interpreted image of what is, what is there. And here you can see that right at the, the bottom of the lake, right, we, we interpret a central uplift, which as I said, is a characteristic of um, uh, impact craters. So this, this then starts giving us a clue. Then there must be something that this is like maybe a, a, the origin is, is impact, uh, meteorite impact related. So this one way we can do that. Another way we can do that is use another geophysical method, what we call the um, gravity, the gravity method. So uh, we all know what gravity is. When you jump up in the sky, when you jump up, you fall down. 
you land back on it because something is always pushing you, right? So we can actually measure the, um, uh, we, can make, we can take gravity measurements acro across the earth. But this is the thing, um, gravity measurements actually change just a little bit as you move across the earth. Why? Because of the mass of whatever is on the surface. So if you have a rock that is really heavy, it, it changes gravity measurement. If there's a rock that is not too heavy, it changes gravity measurement. So if you were to fly over a, a large part of the earth and take gravity measurements as you fly along, what will happen is that the, what you record will not be the same. Gravity measurements will not be the same. There will be slight changes just because of the kind of rocks that are in the subsurface. So if we take a reading like that, then we could determine that there are different kinds of rocks and the rocks will vary based on what they've gone through. So for instance, with the meteorite impact, the force that uh, um, an asteroid hits the ground is so huge that it, it fundamentally changes the rocks in the subsurface, right? And then there's this um, mixture of material in the meteorites of what is there. There's um, um, the, the temperature and the pressure is so high that it just, it just metamorphoses the rocks that are there, right? And all these have signatures. So if, if we were to take gravity measurement, we'll see um, differences in the rocks that can tell us that this is an impact crater. Uh, another method that we use, which is similar, is what we call the magnetic method. So we can also take magnetic measurements. Um, usually how you do that is that you put an equipment on a plane and fly over what, where you are interested in. Uh, now people also use drones to do that. So they put the equipment on the drone or a plane, fly over the area, and then they try and measure the differences. Um, or you could also strap the equipment behind you and then walk across. Because if you are covering a large area, they need to fly over. So for, for the magnetic method, for instance, there will always be changes because um, a meteorite um, uh, coming into, um, an asteroid coming into Earth, right, usually has a lot of iron in it, right? But then when the impact happens, there are a lot of changes because as I said, the high temperature pressure, so there's, we have changes up, uh, occurring in the subsurface. The original rocks will also have a signature in terms of a magnetic signature. But then after the impact, they also change. Okay, so if you were to go and measure or make, take measurements of um, magnetic properties across that area, you probably see, you see these anomalies and this, has been done um, in the uh, uh, bosom tree in part crater over time. Another cool thing you could do is just take satellite images up above the impact crater. So satellite images um, uh, hundreds of miles up in the sky, and we can see um, the changes, how the place So this is an image from um, a paper, and you could realize you can see the changes. You can see how the impact crater looks like. You can this can even help us to know the angle that the you remember when I started, I said there was the, the, the asteroid got in at an oblique angle. So we could know the angle of impact based on how the, the structure has changed. So you see that there's part of um, the crater that is higher than the other side. So you can tell us where the angle of the, the, the asteroid hit from, because then it crashed into to the ground at a particular angle and pushed the mass of rocks to one side. And, and that's the kind of research. So over a long time, so from the 1899 that I mentioned that the, the, the natives complained, the locals complained of the bubbling and the, the smell of sulfur. So different scientists um, then went to the crater to study. Uh, initially, we were just picking up rocks I'm seeing if you can find traces of the asteroid or in there, um, that was done. And then um, different researchers came up with different uh, theories, volcanic orig origin, meteorite impact origin. So for decades, it was like um, a debate between scientists. Um, some say it's volcanic, some say it's meteorite impact. Until somewhere in the 60s, 80s, 90s, there a lot more work came with geophysics and they started seeing the impact crater origins of that. So it all culminated, I think, in 2000 and um, in the early 2000s, 2004, there was an international project, um, uh, international continental drilling uh, project. So what they did was they, they did geophysics work all across magnetic, seismic, um, gravity. And then in addition to that, they actually drilled into the, the crater itself. Okay. so. They drilled into the crater and then picked up samples from below the surface of the lake. So the 
the uplift that I talked about, they actually drilled into that uplift, got samples, and then looked at the samples, looked at their ages, looked at the, um, the signatures, and then were able to say, okay, we are very sure this had impact crater because of the different kinds of magnetism um, uh, effects we've seen, the, the gravity measurements um, we've seen, and the, the um, what do you call it, the, the, the structure of the subsurface. So I, in, in, I did my work there in 2010. We just did ground penetrating radar to see the kind of fault. So that's another thing with impact craters. So there's always a lot of, um, um, the structure changes. So there are a lot of fractures in the subsurface. So uh, in my work, we just try to identify the fractures in the subsurface if there is an impact, uh, a meteorite impact um, that caused it, then we should have a lot of fractures in the subsurface. And we, and we saw a lot of that as well. So um, that, that has been the work over time that has been done at um, the Busum Tree in particular. Um, geophysics has played a key role there because without geophysics, we couldn't have looked below the subsurface to see how, um, the structures have changed and the signatures of all these different um, uh, impacts on the rocks. And that's how come we can now conclusively say that, yes, um, some tree um, happened because of an impact crater. We are still doing more work. So there's still, uh, for instance, there's a, what we call a suevite deposit. So suevites, um, rocks that are left over from the impact that have been transformed by the impact, the, the uh, meteorite impact. So there's a huge deposit in, 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 um, in the impact crater. And um, we are trying to map the extent and see the properties of that survey. All this can help us, just like Solomon said, um, in the future, as humans are trying to explore space, um, Actually, on a lot of other planets and um, extraterrestrial bodies, it's, it's easy to see impact craters. The effects are there to see. The, the, prob the reason we can't see a lot of them on Earth is because of just the weathering that happens on Earth. So usually it, it disappears over time. But on, other, um, on the moon, for instance, because there's no atmosphere, there's nothing, it's, you can see a lot of them there. Right? But if you want to understand those, um, it, the best way to study will be to look at the the, the, the the samples we have on Earth and the impacts we have on Earth. Because here we can go, I can go to Busunchi anytime and pick samples. You can't just fly to the moon if you want to do that tomorrow, right? So um, yeah, so that's that's how we use geophysics um, to, to, to determine that the Busunchi impact crater is from meteorite origin. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, then you can take them. Yeah, so that was amazing. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sia. Thank you. I think it was great. Um, and um, I think it tells us all why um, geophysics is very, very important and how other sciences have to come together to confirm some of these extraterrestrial stuff that we may think of. So um, thank you so much. And um, I think if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat or you can use the raise hand option and we can invite you to unmute and then actual question. Um, yeah, Sarah, is there anything you want to say quickly um, before, I think we already have a question in the chat. Oh, no, just to, yes, again, fascinating. I'm always really fascinated to hear how, how all this works and how you can discover all these things. But yes, we have a, a good question in the chat there. Um, Isaac, I don't know if you want to unmute and ask your question. Or maybe Sarah, you can read him. I don't know. Hello. Yeah, he's there. He's unmuted. Hello, Isaac. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you and, are. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Boateng. Um, we are primary school mates, so it's, it's <laughs> <a pleasure>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just curious. Um, any information yeah you've been looking at the geophysical side but is there any information on when the lake formed was it formed just at the time of impact or it was later down the years and what's the nature of the lake was it like exuding from within the crater or it's just collection of rainfall over the years 
Yeah, hello, uh, Isaac, uh, Ben. That is nice to hear from you. So, yes, um, that's a very interesting question. The, the lake was formed after the impact. So, after the, the impact, this, we have a excavated space that has been left there. So, um, our understanding of how the lake was formed right now is that it was mainly from rainfall over time. So, that gathered, so the, the, because it looks like a bowl. Um, the rainfall just gathered in the in the in the uh, like the crater bowl over time. So um, this 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 question actually brings me um, to an interesting um, fact about Bosumchi. So Bosumchi, the impact crater is um, at a very important place in Ghana. So we, we if if you you you've, um, you've read about the what causes the two seasons in Ghana, the IT. The, the 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 line that moves up and down. Um, so when we have the 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 monsoon winds coming from the coast, and then we have the 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 winds from the desert giving us the hamatan. Where Busumchi is actually, what happens is that the the line moves below and above Busumchi depending on the season, right? So what we actually know is that um, if it's let's say it's the dry season. The line moves below Bosumchi. When it's in the rainy season, the line moves above Bosumchi. So um, Bosumchi has this record of like almost a million years of climate data. If if we drill right into Bosumchi and pick the sediment, because if it's in the dry season, you don't expect that we'll have a lot of sediment because because the lake is entirely dependent on rain. You don't think that it will. The, the, there'll be a lot of rain, so the sediment will not be as thick as when it's the rainy season when there's a lot of rain and it's sweeping up all the sediment around the bowl into the lake. So it's, it's a unique place to actually study climatic records for almost a million years, right? So that's something special about, about Gosumchi. So the lake, we, we are, the understanding is that the lake is totally dependent on rainfall. There's no leakage and there's no water from any other river and it, it, it depends right on only rainfall. And um, even records, recent records, so from 2004, when they did the drilling I was talking about, if you go to Busumchi right now, you realize that they had a huge platform at the edge of the lake where they were docking their ship to go to the... If you go there right now, you can actually see the effect of climate change because that, that dock, the, the, the pier they have there is actually hanging in the air. It's the, the lake has gone way below the level of the dock. When at that time, that was right where they could just jump into the, into the lake. So it tells you... Um, that's one of the reasons you are very sure it's dependent on only rainfall, because the moment the weather changes, the lake goes down. If you have less rainfall over time, the lake level goes down. And you can actually see some of the images I show. There's a tree right in the middle of the, um, not in the middle, but in the lake, right? So it tells you that at some point in history when we didn't have a lot of rainfall, the lake had actually receded. So it had gone down to such a point that there was a tree or there were, there, were, there were trees right there. And then when, of course, rainfall started gathering momentum over time, then um, that place was then assimilated, it was taken in by the lake. Okay. So, so yes, um, we think it's entirely dependent on, on rainfall. Yeah. That's amazing. That's really, really amazing. Thank you. Um, and it, it's a actually very, very good question because it really tells us a lot in terms of yeah. what you're saying um, with the climate. I think this is very interesting. This is very interesting. Mm. Yeah. It's very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so please, if you have any more questions, please put it in the chat. Or I think we can, you can when you use the raise hand option, we can invite you to unmute and then ask your question. So please don't be shy. If you have any questions, please ask. Mm. Um, so Samuel, um, I guess you have a Yes. Uh, well, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Yes, you sure, sure. Thank you very much for this presentation. It, it's interesting, but uh, if we were to be alive by then, there have been a very scary scenario <laughs> to, to see this coming out of space and uh, where do we run to 
So now with the advance in science and technology, how prepared are we in the event that uh, something small, even if it doesn't burn in outer space and gets to Earth, how prepared are we to fight it? Because from the first speaker, there are a lot of these things in between the uh, Mars and Jupiter orbits, and anything can happen. So how prepared are we in case of any eventuality? Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, I think I would like to take the question, uh, unless, I mean, Sarah, or, um, Sarah, you want to? No, Sarah, so you take it, I think. Yeah, yeah you go ahead. Yeah, all right. So um, thank you so much, um, Samuel. So I would want to say that, so um, I think um, from my slide, so I mentioned that um, there are missions, there are several different missions to study some of these asteroids. And one of them is to be able to kind of knock it off. So if we know there's an asteroid heading to Earth like this, there's a way we can actually send a spacecraft to actually detect it. So not kind of like actually to read them the um, uh, up, but actually deflect it. And these are actual research or actual missions that NASA has already begun. Okay. The other, um, the other method, um, Solomon. Yes. Sorry, Solomon. Your 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 audio is kind of going off and on. So maybe you need to be a bit closer. It's kind of going down and then not, yeah. Oh. And I think Samuel, could you mute? I think there's some background noise from Sam. Yeah, Solomon, can you try again? Yeah, is he okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah, so like I was saying, there are several missions already, um, like, um, I mean, we are themed planetary defense missions because we actually send an aster um, the spacecraft to an asteroid to try to actually deflect its core so that it doesn't crash into Earth. Um, the, I think the, in the past, the key idea has always been um, to be able to, if we have any of these asteroids heading to Earth, we can actually send, um, either um, a rocket, which will just go and blow it up. But of course, like Sarah mentioned before, some of these things may be a bad idea because what if you blow it up and get into pieces and then still heads to Earth? So they are actual missions like um, the DART, uh, which is one way where we can actually deflect the course of the asteroid so that it doesn't head towards the Earth. We also have other ones, uh, which is the ARM, which is where we can actually be able to go capture the, um, the asteroid. Again, let me say that these are all very, very interesting and very, very recent development in technology, which we are trying to um, do, uh, or I mean, people are trying to do to be able to help us defend the planet against some of these asteroids. But then um, I want to add, I think we before um, we had a section where we talked about the possibility of some of these asteroids being there. Though, like Sarah said, we have millions of these various asteroids um, in the asteroid belt and also um, um, other places, the possibility of having these asteroids actually hit Earth is very low. And because we are studying them, um, and of course, because of some um, um, things like this section we are doing, we understand their orbit. We know when they are supposed to be, where. And if anything happens, we will be able to pick it up and kind of be prepared. Um, somehow, I hope this answers your question, really. So. People shouldn't be scared that we have. No sure, sure, sure. <laughs> it looks scary, but I think. Uh, thank you very much. All right. I'm um, sorry. Is there any other question? Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Uh, well, one I, I I sort of half answered. So Steve asked, "Is there some sort of asteroid monitoring system over the African region?" Uh, since we know the impact level. So I was in the chat, I was just saying that, um, I mean, basically that there are different organizations that are monitoring asteroids. And I mean, it's, it's global. I mean, they're just monitoring all the asteroids to try and find out as much as possible. You know, as if most of them are just, you know, orbiting, uh, you know, there are others that are closer to earth. And then as we, every so often something could get knocked off course so so it's kind of global because i mean you know when something is knocked off course you don't know where it's going to land anyway you couldn't land anywhere so so it's helping everybody um or if you mean you know is there any asteroid monitoring in africa uh i don't actually know about that i think if it was 
I'm sorry, I was going to say, I think if it was happening, it might be in South Africa, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But basically, whatever monitoring is going on is helping everybody across, across the globe. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, kind of not really too related, but I, I wanted to um, kind of ask um, Dr. Cyril. So, I mean, knowing that because of how special it is with the um, parametric data we could get from it, is there um, like attempts or, I mean, I, I know um, you're already working on stuff like that, but um, do we have an actual, say, research which is just dedicated to that? Because that's something special. That's something we we'll probably know will not be able to get, which is a million worth of data. So do you already have stuff like that going on? So, so it's like you're asking a question that that, that is the objective of a recent, um, recent research we are doing, actually. Because we, we um, um, one of my students and I did some work. We're trying to see how much work has been done from the Ghana perspective. So. Um, so she has been really steady at like the impact creators. A lot of people have been interested in it. But in terms of the output from Ghana itself, it has been very low. Um, and, and what we've realized is, um, is basically because just like anything else in Ghana, um, we've not put resources specifically for that. So most of the work that has been done, even with uh, Ghanaians included, is because the funding has come from outside. Right, so we are not actually doing research that is, um, how do you call it, home-driven, kind of like maybe the dangers I've mentioned and the stuff that I've mentioned. So if you want to ask if there's a government policy that is putting money aside for this to be researched, no, there isn't. So, so a lot of the work that has been done in the past has been in the, um, um, in, in this, has been organized by, international agencies and then of course um, here in USC has always been a partner um, because we are here and been doing some work so um, there's always somebody on the project but continuous data gathering um, that's something that for instance I'm thinking of doing because like I was saying just recently realized that even the first um, trigger for scientific interest was because of um, the bubbling of the lake and the smell of sulfur. And since then, nobody has really focused on finding out what is the source of that. So you get you get the idea, huh? But generally it's because I think Ghana does not assign a lot of money for research. So that's that's the problem. So most of this is either you do it on um, your own time with your own dime and that kind of thing, but let's see, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, really, for you guys already being interested in doing these things. I think some of these sections that we do will send a message to um, a few people. So who would be able to help? Because it has an impact on the environment, which is the people living around, which is also important. So thank you so much. Um, Sarah, I think you want to say something. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry, I was a bit, there was a, a bit of a strange thing happening in my house with that cat and everything, so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but just Steve put another uh, good question in the chat, which was um, just as we can predict uh, CMEs, that's coronal mass ejections from the sun and flares, is it possible to do the same for asteroids because they all have uh, relatively the same effects? So again, I, I started answering, but others can also add just that, um, I, mean, I mean, the first thing is if we can monitor the asteroids, I mean, you know, when you see them you, and, and you track them, then you're, you know, you can monitor their orbit. You can predict their orbit. And, and by, by tracking, then you make sure that the orbit stays the same. Because as I said, if then the orbit could change. You know, if there's a collision or something, you know, there could be a slight change. Um, so, it, so the tracking is, is, is really important. Um, so sometimes, yes, they find that, oh, I mean, maybe it's an asteroid that's already close to Earth. Uh, sometimes it's something that was further away but gets knocked in. Uh, they can track, and every so often, I mean, every, I don't know, every few months at least, um, you hear something on the news of, oh, there's there's going to be a, a a close close pass by of an asteroid. And when they say close, I mean, sometimes it's one of those things where you see those huge headlines, asteroid going close to Earth, and everyone thinks, you know, I get messages saying, oh, is it going to, you know, when they say close, it might be like five million kilometers 
you know i mean that's that is what is considered close so there's no way it's going to hit but it just means the scientists are tracking it um so so most of the, the the very big ones usually we can see and they can be tracked so in that way you can say well yes we can predict that it's you know it's not going to hit or if something happens and it gets deflected then we've probably got time to work out oh okay yes it might well hit in a few years time it's actually the the smaller ones, which wouldn't, you know, which would, could maybe, you know, damage a city. I mean, I know I don't want to scare people, but the, the, those are the, the sizes that's a bit harder to find. You know, the very big ones, we can see them. The small ones aren't going to do damage, but it's kind of the in betweeny ones that uh, sometimes we, they're, you know, they're harder to see because they're smaller. So, so we can't predict everything but again it's just constant constant monitoring and tracking and finding more and more of them and that, i mean that's the only way we can predict what might happen so i don't if i don't know solomon you want to add anything to that i think that was that was perfect yeah exactly so yeah we don't have anything to add. all right so um i think our time um so if there's no more questions especially questions to dr sarah button because i think it will be great and um, since we have him on today you can ask any questions related to um, what we have talked about or if anything else i think we can do so but because of our time i think we should i think isaac has his hand up or unless it was an old hand okay isaac do you have a, another question or was it from before yeah, it's, it's, no uh, so i was just wondering with regards to the monitoring and following from the talk last week about how radio uh telescopes are used to monitor satellites and uh, celestial bodies. I'm just wondering what are the tools that are used in monitoring asteroids? Is it uh, telescopes, radio telescopes as usual, or they have some other uh, tools they use? Okay, um, so um, yeah, I think I'm going to take it. Uh, so yes, um, so most of these asteroids, um, we can actually, because of I mean, their um, constituents, we can actually image them even with radio telescope because it can pick up um, some of these radiations from um, stuff stuff like that. So we, we image them with different, I think, different imaging techniques. So some, sometimes in the optical, um, sometimes even in the infrared among um, some other wavelengths. So um, that, that's how we do it. And I think the most um, efficient ways usually would be when we have a space telescope um, probably usually close to some of these asteroid belts and we are able to see them and then track them all the time, yeah. Right, yeah, so um, thank you so much, Isaac, thank you. Um, Sarah, I guess I can move on to the announcement. Uh, yeah, or I can quickly do the, um, what's in the night sky? Oh yeah, I forgot. I'll be very quick. Okay, so what's in the night sky or in the morning sky? At the moment, it's early morning. So uh, again, you may have seen this on some other platforms and social media. Um, at the moment, and for the next few weeks at least, you actually can see all five, what we call the naked eye planets visible, but before dawn. So you have to be an early riser, I'm afraid. I'm really bad at doing that. So, uh, so that means uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus and then Mercury you might be able to see if you've got a very good view of the eastern horizon because it's quite low down so Mercury might be quite difficult to see so all those five you can see with the naked eye you don't need uh, binoculars or, or a telescope so this is so tomorrow morning you should you can you'll be able to see all of them uh, the moon there is actually I think a very tiny tiny crescent moon next to Venus and then during the month um, you know, the moon will, you know, the moon is in a different position each night, so it will move past the planets. Uh, it will be near to Saturn on the 16th, near to Jupiter on the 19th, uh, near to uh, Mars on the 21st, and again a tiny crescent near to Venus on the 26th. So those five planets 
uh, will, will you can see them you know every morning uh, as it uh, just a few, after a few days from now mercury will probably drop out of sight but you'll still be able to see the other four saturn jupiter mars and venus I think that's all i have for oh yes so um i think sarah has already given um, our first major um, announcement um, which was um, that um, sarah and then um, Rosa have been able to detect an actual asteroid, which is amazing. And some of these projects are ones that we encourage people to take up. And I think we send them out if um, some of these um, opportunities come up. So uh, yeah, people can keep going and keep cracking. So um, so coming up, um, so we do have, um, so in I think next month, uh, we would um, have the James Webb Space Telescope, which is very amazing. Um, being able to um, send back to Ed some some of the very first images that it has taken of the universe. Um, ironically, it may look better than some of the image that, I mean, the image that you have on the side, uh, which is um, a talk that I'm going to give, I think after um, we have the um, section on James Webb Space Telescope. So this is something you should look out for. If you don't already know, we have an, a new amazing space telescope. Um, better than the Hubble Space Telescope, which is going to bring very amazing images. So look up for um, next month. So next month, we are going to do all about the James Webb Space Telescope, look at the various images, and um, probably do a little more. So right after that, like I said, um, I'll be giving a talk on young massive stars. So even if you don't know what stars are, you should know that stars are similar to human beings. They go from being a child and then being an adult and everything else. And we have very, very young um, ones that sometimes happen to be very, very big. Um, and these are some of the things that I do study. And um, I think um, we will be talking about them. So these are some of our upcoming sections. So tell a friend to tell a friend so that you guys can um, um, see us um, next. And do I have something else? Um, yeah, I think that's all. So I would just like to remind everybody uh, so look out for our email where we will send a link to the recording of this section so that if you missed anything and you want to rewatch, you can do so. And also to maybe if you want um, to ask any questions, I think we can uh, put the procedures um, email address and our WhatsApp and I mean stuff like that so that you can get in touch and ask any questions that you may have. And also if you have any topic that um, you think it's interesting you want us to cover, you can also send suggestions to us um, so that we can get experts to talk about it. Uh, Sarah, do you have anything to add? And maybe Dr. Cyril too? Uh, no, I think that's fine. Just to, to once again say thank you to uh, Dr. Cyril Boateng for that really fascinating talk. It's always great to really hear from people, you know, doing the real work and finding out from their research what's going on. It's really fascinating. And thank you to everybody for joining and the great questions. And so, yes, thank you a lot and see you next time, hopefully. Dr. Cyril, again, thank you so, so much and all the best with the research and the whole we can actually do. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks for everybody. Um, thanks to everybody else too for joining and listening. Um, have a great one. So, um, thanks to everybody. And your your voice is coming and going again, Solomon. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I keep moving back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> so let me stop recording.